comfortable then? Uh, no. Too comfortable? That's, that's all right. Well, it's modern furniture for you. <laughs> now, Phil, it's 18 years since you started out with Genesis. Yep. And since then, the spotlight has mainly been on you as a drummer and a solo artist. But the spotlight is short to change, and it's going to be the spotlight on you as an actor in, actor. Your, first, as a, in your first lead role. Darling. In the film of Buster. Yes. But let's go back to the beginning. Like, you know, how old were you when you started acting? Um, my mum and dad used to have a little boat, and um, they belonged to a club where other people with little boats belonged to. And we all used to go down every Thursday night for boat meetings. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was more interesting than I'm making the it sound. The whole family. Yeah, the whole family. <laughs> my brother was there, my sister was there, and uh, my mum and dad. Anyway, the, every twice a year they had shows, you know, and every Christmas they put pantomimes on. So I was out in front of an audience at a very early age, as the youngest and the smallest. I was always, um, oh, look at him, look. It's that kind of thing. So I was starting to do, like, you know, pantomimes and things then, and then I did it. Uh, throughout my early years, really, and then when I was 14, I got the part of the Artful Dodger in Oliver, which is professional West End, you know, production of Oli uh, West End production of Oliver. <laughs> and then um, I started doing other things after that, BBC Two, BBC Two plays, and all kinds of stuff, voiceovers. Were, were you like, like son of an ambitious mother who looked at a little boy Phil and said, <laughs> "Oh, he's going to go far." And just no. carted you around as sort of like amateur, amateur dramatics. And well, she like had to cart me around because she was an agent. So she didn't actually have to do that. No, in fact, it worked in reverse, you know, like most people do have pushy mothers, most uh, kids that go to stage schools and that. But my mother was asked to start an agency by Barbara Speak, who ran a dancing school. And they st the school's still going strong. I mean, mum's been doing it 25 years. So she used to get jobs, calls for jobs for kids, you know, and she used to think people would think what you just said. So she never used to send me. <laughs> so it actually worked in the, the reverse. But eventually I did get sent for a job of, for the Dodger, and, uh, and then after that I did all that other stuff. And... See, see, now a lot of people have spoken to me, oh, Phil Collins, he was the artful Dodger in Oliver. Mm. And I've got to admit that I actually never, um, I never caught it. Mm. Now, um, when you well, did the... it was the... off before you were born, well, that's probably. probably why, probably why, and I haven't <laughs> seen the repeats. But um, when, you, when you did the audition, did you have to sort of sing a piece or something? Yes. I mean, when you go to a drama school, stage school, you, um, you usually have a couple of songs that when you go to an audition for a musical, yeah. That you've given the music and there's a piano at the side of the stage and you. Hello, my name's uh, Collins, Philip Collins. Right, how old are you, dear? You know, and all this kind of thing. <laughs> and then you do ding, ding, ling, 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 ling. You start singing the song, you know, and I don't remember what mine was. I think it was Consider Yourself, which was a song that was in Oliver. Is that a song you sang? Yeah. I tell you, look, come on. <laughs> this is the no, It's show. a wind-up, isn't it? This, <laughs> it's taken me three and a half minutes to get to this point. Um, now, come on, it's late night. I wasn't TV warned show. about this. I wasn't warned you're about relaxed, this. You're relaxed, you know, you're taking time. Can you just give us a quick bit? Just a quick bit. Go on, please, please, go on. Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself part la, of the la, furniture. La, la. We um, have a lot to mm, spare. Mm, Who mm, cares? Mm, Whatever we got, we share. Well, I've ruined that. I'm sorry about that. Beautiful. Come on now, come on. Well, I now, deserve more now than that. You've done, I will ask you to consider yourself part of the furniture and relax, because <laughs> from now on, it's all sheer joy, OK? So, so, Downhill all the way. <laughs> so you went on from the Artful Dodger, you say, did voiceovers, etc. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're in this rock group, Genesis. What, 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 where did the acting stop? Um, well, I did this thing called Calamity the Cow, which was a children's film foundation film, Saturday morning pictures. And I fell out with the director, long, boring story, but I mean, I fell out with the director and I decided, because I'd oh, been playing, London. well, I was about 16. I, I had been playing the drums since I was five and I'd always wanted to be a drummer. And as I grew older, as I got a little bit better, all I wanted to do was be in a band. And of course, a band then was a group. He called it a group and they were like the Shadows and the, and of course, the Beatles. So as um, soon as I could, I, I stopped the acting and really this, um, this escapade with Calamity the Cow sort of cemented it. But I, uh, I stopped acting and told my mum no more jobs. My dad, who has worked in the city for 40 years, bless him, before he died, um, loved me being in, in the West End, because he could say, my son's in the West End, as opposed to, my son's a drummer in a drug-crazed rock and roll group. <laughs> yeah, that didn't help, you know, so he didn't really like that much. But uh, I, I carried on, and really, I, I just went in from band to band to band to band. Now, Genesis were formed in, at Charterhouse three years before you joined them. Um, how did you sort of get well, the job? Well, they were formed at public school. I mean, there, there were two bands at public school. You never, you know, there's always a band at school. And there was two bands, and the best of the bands got together. And there was Gabriel Banks, Rutherford, and uh, Anthony Phillips, who left the band very early on. And they had a drummer that 
they had, they had a drummer, and they, they eventually they left school and they made an album with Jonathan King. And then they joined Charisma Records with Tony Stratton Smith and made Trespass, which was the very first proper Genesis album. And then the drummer left, or Anthony Phillips left, and they got rid of the drummer. Um, I answered an advert in Melody the Maker, you know. A uh, drummer, a uh, group seats, seats drummer sensitive to acoustic music. And I wasn't particularly, but I needed the job, so I went. And uh, I got it. It's quite astonishing that um, at such an early stage, a band can have got together what has been proved to be, you know, four of the greatest, most accomplished musicians and vocalists in, in, in England. Well, it depends who you talk to, really. Um, <laughs> now, Peter, obviously, but, it was, it was a, there was, at one point, it was a very strong group. I mean, um, I said at one point, I mean, I think it's still a strong group. But, I mean, when Peter was in the group and I was in the group, and there were Tony and Mike and Steve Hackett, uh, we were amongst the early 70s experimental groups, if you like. Uh, we, um, we've always enjoyed writing together, and that's why we stayed together. I mean, I've been in the band 18 years, you know, and it doesn't seem like 18 years, although that's, in fact, what you it is. You still look like a nipper. Oh, <laughs> but, um, how did you feel when Peter Gabriel left and sort of you became the, the vocalist? Did you feel, like, a lot of pressure? I mean, is, was he, is he a big act to live up to in terms of... Singing? Not really, not when you know him. <laughs> no, he's a, he's a different kind of chap when you, I mean, he's different from what other people think, I think. But, no, it was... We actually had a decision to make, you know, and I think we all made it subconsciously that when Peter said he was going to leave, we said, well, we're going to carry on. Because by this time, people were saying, um, well, Peter is the group. You know, they assume the singer writes everything. They assume I write everything now because I'm a singer. They always do because you're singing the words, they think you write them. And uh, so we all sort of had a little chat and said, we're going to show them. Even if it's not a hit, a success or whatever, we're going to show them that we are four people out of a five-people group. And four-fifths of the writing was us. And uh, so we got together and we, we stayed together after we left and did Trick of the Tail. And I just sang because we couldn't find anybody else. We got into the studio, did the tracks, still hadn't got a singer, so I started singing. And then uh, one by one we rattled the songs off and then we finished the album, said, right, we've got an album, but we still haven't got a singer and we want to go on the road. Mm. And uh, we couldn't find a singer still, so I said, excuse me, <laughs> I don't mind having a crack at it if we can find a drummer. So we got Bill Bruford in to play drums and uh, I went out front. You've started acting again. Um, what, what sort of brought this about? Was it sort of, right, I'm satisfied with the musical career, I want to get back into where I started? No, there was no desperate urge to get back to the roots because I didn't really consider me, uh, acting to be my roots, although that's what I did when I was a kid. I think it was just um, after the Miami Vice episode that I did, I kind of enjoyed it, thought there might be more to this in me. Wouldn't it be fun to do something different? I mean, when I did the Vice thing, I w was getting up at six every morning, and I think, this is great, this is something different. I'm not, I'm finding out something else about myself that I can do. And uh, so I just put the word out uh, to my manager, sort of, you know, if they've got any scripts come in, let's, let's see them if they're good. So he usually re reads things in half an hour and he sends them to me and it'd take me three weeks to read So the you've always had, there's always been offers coming in? There has actually, yeah. So what was it about this one then? I just thought I could do it. Julie Walters was going to be in it and I'm a big fan of hers and she, I, could, I read it with her in mind and I just, I just thought it was a great script. So who know. chose who? Did Julie Walters say, I want Phil Collins as my leading man, or did you say, I want Julie Walters as my leading lady, or did someone else put you together? Someone else put us together. Uh, Julie had worked with David Green, the director, before, and David thought Julie would be great as, as June Edwards. And um, David then saw Miami Vice, and him and his wife thought, there's your bus. They'd been looking for a Buster Edwards for a long time, <laughs> as everybody had. Yeah. Um, no, they'd been looking for someone to play Buster, and... Uh, so we got together and, and we started talking about it and they said and Julie Waters might be playing June and I said well I'm not doing it unless June Julie plays June because I was so excited by that prospect that uh, you know we left it at that yeah. now um it's been in the press all over the press and I'm sure you're gonna hit me when I you ask you this no, no. question but um you know you wrote to um, Prince Charles and Princess Diana advising them not to come to the premiere um, yeah. Surely it's a film you're proud of. Yeah, very proud yeah. of it. And so, what is it about the film that you feel they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't endorse? I don't think there is anything in the film they shouldn't endorse. But unfortunately, I am not alone. Um, or I am alone, should I say, in thinking that in terms of the media. I mean, there's lots of, there's lots of people that have seen the film and said, like, what is the fuss about? Because it's, it's the kind of film that we have been saying it is. That is to say, it is a moral film that, that does basically say that crime for Buster Edwards didn't really pay. He did this, his marriage almost broke up, his life became disintegrated in Mexico where he thought was going to be paradise. And he had to give himself up and come back 
you know, mm. to get himself out of this hole. So for him, he did it for the love of his wife. But unfortunately, there's, you know, there's lots of people that, that think the film is about a certain thing and consequently uh, protested about it. And some people, and uh, like the Mills family, Jack Mills' family, that, yeah. Um, the driver who got crushed. I, yeah, I do sympathise with. But, I mean, we deliberately played down that aspect of the film, the story in the film. With the, you do see him being crushed, contrary to popular belief. And you do see the driver with a handkerchief and blood close up in a lot of the next two or three minutes in the next scene. But we thought, you know, the, the robbery is like two minutes of a hundred-minute film. And uh, the rest of it is the romance between Buster and his wife. And that is the whole reason for doing the film in the first place. So just briefly, would you say it's, you know, it's a sort of a serious re recreation of events, or is it a love story, or is it a light-hearted sort of...? Well, it's, of... it's not a documentary, so it's not a... Re we've stuck as much as possible to the facts. I mean, there's the first scene in the film is Buster picking up a dustbin and throwing it through a window to get a suit out with a dummy. Now, when I read that, I said, Jay, no one's going to believe this. But it actually happened. So there are some strange things in the film that you wouldn't believe to be true that are actually true. Um, and pretty much 90% of it is based on fact. Uh, but the robbery is just this backdrop, provides this backdrop for this extraordinary relationship mm. that started when they were 18 and, and I say, has gone through 35 years of marriage to now and they're still together. That is what fascinated Colin Schindler when he wrote the script. And that is really what the film's about. That is, and it is a moral story, and that is why I invited the Prince and Princess of Wales to come in the first place. Yeah. And it was only the kerfuffle created by the media that said, listen, uh, you know, they shouldn't come and do this, they shouldn't do this. And then various people started protesting, the police thought they were being made fools of, blah, blah, blah. And suddenly it would not have been possible to have a, an event. They, it, it would have been very embarrassing for them to have been there, and it would have been very embarrassing for me to, have, in, you know, to be seen to have having invited them and sitting there with them. Well, so Phil, we... um, thanks very much for coming. I wish you all the best with the, um, the film Buster. Hey, y'all. Hope it's going to be smashed. Um, just, you know, literally, it was all right, one word. Is, it, is this the end of music or is music going to continue? No, it's not the end of music. Yes, it will continue.